This screencast is an introduction to Branch and Bound. Branch and Bound is a approach to developing algorithms for solving optimization problems. Uh, it's very helpful to be familiar with backtracking before you watch this screencast. And if you're not, I'd suggest watching the previous screencast that I've done on backtracking to get for yourself familiar with the ideas. So, as I said, Branch and Bound applies to optimization problems where you basically create a bound on the objective function, the thing you're trying to maximize or minimize, that occur in the subtree. In other words, you're searching through the state space tree, just as we did with backtracking, just as you do in backtracking. And at each step, step of the way, you compute a bound that basically, usually, will be combining a partial evaluation of the function you're trying to optimize along with some computation of the best you can do by continuing down the tree. If this bound is worse than what you've already achieved with some actual solution, in other words, you've found hopefully some solution that is an approximation to the optimal so far, then you don't continue down that subtree. There's no point in evaluating possible solutions along that branch. We say the tree is pruned. That's pretty abstract. Let's Think about a simple example. Suppose you have a state space tree and you're trying to find the maximum and you've found, already found a possible solution with a value of 100. Well, if you know that the subtree that you're working on can only has candidate solutions whose value is at most 90, then you know there's no point to going on and searching further down the tree because you've already had a solution that's 100. So you know that anything that's less than or equal to 90 could not possibly be the optimal solution. So to illustrate um, the idea of branch and bound, we're going to look at an important problem called the assignment problem. And the idea of the assignment problem is illustrated down here. You have uh, four people and four jobs. And what you want to do is assign one job to each person, and it has to be a different job for each different person. So in other words, uh, a possible solution would be nine job one going to person A, job two going to person B, job three going to person C, and job four going to person D. If we did that, if we made that assignment of jobs to people, then the cost, this matrix is supposed to, rep these numbers represent the costs associated with assigning a job to the person. The cost would be nine plus four plus one plus four, so it would be 18. And you can see there are lots of different assignments possible. In fact, the number of assignments is n factorial. So what we're going to want to do is we'll form the state space tree, but we're going to want to prune it, prune it. And how are we going to prune it? We have to find a lower bound for the cost because what we're trying to do is we're trying to minimize the cost of the assignment. So we want to assign the jobs in such a way that the cost is as slow as, low as possible. And so in order to do this, we're going to have, we want the bound to be tight. And you'll see what I mean by that in the example. We want it, in other words, we want it to be as close to the best that might be achieved. And we want it to be fast to compute. Because again, we're searching a very large state space tree. And so we don't want to spend a lot of time computing the bound. Now there are trade-offs. Uh, the tighter the bound, the more you can give up on the fast to compute. But ideally, you'd like it to be both tight and fast to compute. So for our lower bound, um, what we're going to do is for any unassigned jobs, we'll ignore the constraint that a job can only be assigned once. So when we start out, no jobs are assigned. And what we're, we, we need to get a bound. We want to have a bound on the whole tree just to illustrate what's going on. And so what we do is we take the lowest cost for person A, and we consider that the cost for person A. The lowest cost for person B is 3, lowest cost for person C is 1, lowest cost for person D is 4. So obviously we violated the constraint of assigning job 3 to only one person. We've assigned it to two people. But again, this is going to be cheaper, right? This will be lower cost than any other solution because we've always picked the smallest number. But it's not a, not a solution, but it's a bound. It's a lower bound on the solution. Okay, so we start out and the lower bound is going to be equal to 10, which is 2 plus 3 plus 1 plus 4. Now, for the first 
possible level for the next level of the state space tree, what can we do? Do we can assign job one to person A, job two, job three, job four to person A. So those are the four branches. A gets one or A gets two, A gets three, A gets four. Now, what we do is now let's compute the bounds for these different branches. So if A gets one, okay, then job one gets assigned a cost of nine. Person B, C, and D are unassigned. So we pick, again, we pick the smallest number in the row, but they can't be in the first column because we've already assigned that. So we ignore the, con again, we ignore the constraint. And so for job, person B, we give them job three. For person C, we give them job three. And for person D, we give them job four. So again, this is a lower bound because it's better than we do, could possibly do if we did not violate the constraint. So in this case, that adds up to be, if you had to do the math, 17. Okay. Now if we job, do job number 2 to person A, that's this node, now we can see where is that down here. Okay, so we've assigned job 2. So now we can't use those. We can't assign job 2 to anybody else because it's already assigned. And then, again, we ignore the constraint for the unassigned people. And so we get 3, 1, and 4. That's the same as what we had up here. So again, the upper bound here is, or I'm sorry, the lower bound here is still 10. Um, for here, job A gets, um, person A gets job 3. And so they're assigned, uh, where are we? Person A gets job 3. So they're assigned a 7. And now job t person two, B will get job 2. Person C will get job 1. And person D will get job 4. Now, it turns out this is actually is a solution, but all we're doing at this point, we're, we're ignoring all that. We're ignoring the constraint, and we get a lower bound of 20. Similarly, I'll let you do the work through the math. When A gets assigned job 4, then uh, the lower bound turns out to be 18. So now, we've got a decision to make. We've got these four possible subtrees, and we want to choose which one to expand. So the way we we have we could do depth first search, we could do breadth first search, but one way that you haven't seen yet is we're going to do what's called best first search. So as we're looking, as we're constructing these nodes, we keep track of the lowest upper bound, lower bound. Sorry. So this is the most promising branch. So this is the branch we're going to expand on now. And the next slide shows that. So here we are um, with these four. And this had the best, the smallest lower bound, right? So this is the most promising in terms of potentially having a good minimizing solution in it. Um, and we expand it out. And now we do assign uh, B job one, uh, here B gets job three, and here B gets job four. If we compute these lower bounds, we see that this is 13, and this looks like it's the most promising. And then we come down here, and indeed, we get a um, solution of cost 13. Now, at this point, we have a solution. It's 13. Now, look what's happened. If we go with best first search, we basically have been storing these nodes on a priority queue, and we go through and we look at all the other nodes, and they're all too large, right? We've got a solution that's 14, but we know the minimum possible solution, say, in this node, I'm sorry, that's 13, the minimum possible solution in this node is 14. So it, the solution, we can't find a better solution than 13 in this subtree. Here's 17, same issue. 17 here, same issue. So no, we can stop right there. We know that this must be the solution because it's better than the lower bounds on any of the other trees. This is this is the kind of thing where uh, this is an example of where branch and bound really works well. But there's no guarantee that this is going to happen for different instances of the problem.
So now let's revisit knapsack problem and we'll try to apply branch and bound to it. Now you'll notice uh, I've got four items here um, with weights and values specified in this table. I've also included this value to weight ratio. The reason being I'm going to use that and I hope you'll use it to develop an upper bound. So again this is a maximization problem so we're looking for an upper bound. So again once we have uh, if we have a solution and the upper bound is less than that, we know we're not going to have to explore that branch in the tree. So again, we're going to try to use, ultimately I'm going to use the best, best first search strategy. And I want you to pause the screencast here for a second and think about how you compute the upper bound. So just start, start by thinking, well, what's the upper bound? What's an upper bound on the solution right at the start? What do you know, what can you compute really quickly that tells you that the maximum solution has to be something, at most something? In other words, what's, a, what's an upper bound for what the solution could possibly be? And then once you've done that, try to generalize it so that as you work your way down the state space tree, you can compute for each of the subtrees what the upper bound is going to be for those subtrees. So take a few seconds, figure out how to, as the tree grows, how to compute an upper bound at each node. So here's the key idea, the upper bound. Fill any remaining space in the knapsack with an item, so an imaginary item, with the same value to weight ratio as the largest of the remaining items. So if the items are sorted by value to weight, you can just use the value to weight of the next item. So right at the beginning, uh, the value to weight ratio of the next item is item 1, so that's 10. So the upper bound, and we've got a capacity of 10, so the upper bound is going to be 100. So once we've got this upper bound at 100 to begin, then we either include item 1 or don't include item 1. If we include item 1, we now have a weight of 4 and a value of 40, and the upper bound is going to be 40, plus the remaining capacity, which is 6, 10 minus 4, times the value to weight ratio of the next item, which is 6. So that's going to be 40 plus 6 times 6, which is 40 plus 36, which is 76. Here, notice what happens. We don't include the first item, so we still got capacity of 10 left over, but um, the next item only has a value to weight ratio of 6, so now the upper bound is 60. So of these two, this is the best upper bound, and we're going to do best first search. So we'll expand this one. Well, if we try to include two, item two, uh, we can't because it violates the constraint. So we can prune off that whole subtree right away because it violates the constraint. If we don't include two, then right, we still have a value of 40, but now the next item only has a value of five, value to weight ratio of five. And so 5 times 6 is 30, so now the upper bound is going to be 70. So 70 is still better than 60, so now we'll expand this node. And if we include 3, then we're going to get um, a weight of 9, item 3, weight of 9. And so because that's 5 plus 4, and we'll get a value of 65. 40 plus 25, and there's a amount of space left is just 1, so that gives us 1 times 4 is 4, so that gives us 69 for our upper bound here. On this side, we don't include it. Uh, we do the calculation, we get an upper bound of 64, so this is the most promising node. Um, so we now add, uh, try to add 7. Uh, the weight's too big, so it's not feasible, and without it, the value now is at 64. There's still the one unit of remaining space, but there's no other items. So we just get a value of 65. So that's a possible solution. Okay. Um, and what if we go look, um, the next biggest up the biggest upper bound available is 64. That's inferior. So we can prune that. We don't have to go down and look at that. Over here the upper bound was 60. 
Um, and again, that's less than the solution we've already got, which is 65. So we can prune this whole subtree. And so bingo, we are done. We know we have an optimal solution because there are no more nodes to look at. Again, this is kind of a misleading example in the sense that uh, branch inbound is so effective so quickly and finds a solution right away. This is pretty unusual. There are lots of cases where the solution is going to be over in this part of the tree and the upper bounds are all going to be fairly close to one another. And so even once you find a solution, you're not going to be able to eliminate a large number of nodes. So this slide just tries to summarize uh, the approach. Uh, you want to tr prune the tree as soon as you can using some funct bounding function uh, that will guarantee that no better solution can be bound found further down the tree. Uh, it prunes the, the subtree as soon as the bounding function is inferior to the best solution found so far, which in some cases argues that you want to set things up so you find a solution fairly quickly um, that's pretty good, so a pretty good solution initially so you can uh, keep from creating too many nodes uh, and you can prune subtrees early on. Um, and finally, uh, you use the bounding function to prioritize which nodes are expanded, namely best for a search. Now again, uh, this is the only thing I've been using in these examples, but you, there are times when depth first search might be a better strategy, or even just breadth first search. And there are some other strategies that might you might find useful. But um, for now, just get used to using best for a search and how to create the bound, worry about creating the bounding function correctly. It, in general, it's very difficult to know what performance to expect. Um, and it can, again, it can be very dependent on the particular instance of the problem that you happen to be working on. So I hope that was helpful. Uh, that's it for Branch Mount for now.